Well, um, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to the Society's Out of London meeting. Um, this meeting was scheduled to be in Exeter, uh, but circumstances have meant we've had to be online. So a uh, very warm welcome to all of you who can, uh, have been able to join. And uh, I look forward to being in Exeter in person for the meeting next year. Um, can we start by having the minutes of the last meeting, Andrew? Uh, the minutes of an ordinary meeting of the Society of Antiquaries of London on Thursday, 16th of March, 2023, held at Burlington House and online. Professor Martin Millett, President in the Chair. The minutes of the ordinary meeting of Thursday, 9th of March, 2023, were read and signed. The following communication was then laid before the Society. Before the Great Orm, the discovery and exploitation of metal ores in early Bronze Age Britain by Dr. Simon Timberlake. Thanks for return for this communication. The president announced that the next meeting would be online only from Exeter on Thursday, 23rd of March, 2023, and then adjourned the meeting. A reception followed. Um, I assume that I can sign those as a true and complete record, although I note the date for today's meeting is the 30th and not the 23rd, Andrew. Uh, the, well spotted. Thanks. Uh, uh, the main business of this evening's meeting, this afternoon's meeting, is to hear um, a lecture by our fellow Dr Duncan Sawyer. Duncan is a Professor of Archaeology at the University of Central Lancashire. He's published several books, one on ethics and burial archaeology, another on early Anglo-Saxon cemeteries, kinship, community identity. He spent um, a lot, lot of the last decade excavating both uh, near Cambridge at Oakington, the early Anglo-Saxon cemetery, and on Ribchester Roman Fort. Um, his most recent work uh, develops his interest in Anglo-Saxon archaeology um, and has involved uh, the intersection between archaeology and ancient DNA. Um, his resulting in a recently published paper in Nature, co-authored, uh, called The uh, Archaeology of My Anglo-Saxon Migrations and the Formation of Early English Gene Pool, uh, which was also covered in a special issue of Current Archaeology earlier this year. And Duncan's very kindly uh, joined us today uh, to talk on this topic uh, with the title uh, DNA and Anglo-Saxon Migrations, Community Identity and Burial Practice, AD 450 to 750. So over to you, Duncan. Hi, thank you very much for the, for the invite. I'll just um, share my screen if I can. That's that one. Uh, and hopefully you can see that. That should be good. Okay. So. What I don't like is when you do this, then you then lose your, your own screen. Okay, well, hopefully you can see that, that's good. So um, what I'm going to do today is, is to talk about the archaeology and the DNA um, that was presented in that um, nature paper that Martin referenced very kindly there, and also in the, in the issue of, of current archaeology as well. What I also like to do is, is to explore how those have been received by the popular press. So I'm going to, to discuss this in, in two parts. And I'm going to signpost those parts. First of starting off with the, the archaeological and genetic information, and then sort of explore that wider context. And the reason I want to do that is, is illustrated, I think, quite nicely by the two pictures that I've placed on this um, title slide, both of which I took from the BBC website off the Council of Europe website in, in January and are part of a continuing debate about the role of migration and small, small boat migration into, into Britain, but also across Europe and into Europe in particular. Um, and I think it's, it's sort of interesting that we, we can have archaeological conversations about migration, but we possibly shouldn't necessarily completely divorce those from the modern context that we find ourselves in. So, to work. So the first part then, the DNA and the archaeological evidence. So just before the COVID lockdown, um, we might characterise 
the sort of the historiography of, of archaeology or the sort of the way that we've been discussing a post-Roman migration events as being extremely disparate, possibly more than it ever had been before. I've, I've flagged up two publications in this slide that um, sort of illustrate that quite nicely, both of which um, sort of pursue the idea of continuity from the Roman period into the early Middle Ages. Um, and that stands in contrast to quite a lot of the historical narrative that, that pre-existed. So archaeological discourse really was, was sort of all over the place. Was there a Anglo-Saxon migration, an early medieval migration? Was there not one? Was there continuity? What was the size and scale of that? Um, had sort of, there was no um, agreement uh, and there was no real narrative taking place that, that could explore that. And so genetic information is really providing us with new information that can help explore um, the biology and the movement of biological entities, people, which is, which is an extremely useful thing to be able to do. The history of ancient DNA studies goes back some time. Back in, in 95, um, Richard Sykes and Hedges sampled a dozen or so individuals from Fingersham, Berensfield, Catterick and Ipswich in an attempt to, to answer these sorts of questions. But the, the sort of ancient DNA studies, the science involved in ancient DNA wasn't really up to it at that point, and they were unsuccessful, unfortunately. Back in 2012, um, I had a go with Sarah Edwards from Huddersfield University um, with a funded Leverhulme project where we looked at Apple Down, um, Anglo-Saxon Cemetery in West Sussex, because there's some quite interesting structures in there that, that suggest difference in, in the populations. And again, unfortunately, because of the nature of um, where we sampled from and where we were required to sample from from the museum and the nature of, of ancient DNA science at that time, those samples weren't successful then, although we were able to incorporate them into this larger and later project. So until reasonably recently, it hasn't been that successful. In 2016, I was involved in a project uh, with Sanger Institute, where we were able to explore a small number of, of, of samples from um, primarily from Oakington, early Anglo Saxon Cemetery, the site that I've been excavating in Cambridgeshire, um, and, and a small number of, of individuals from nearby uh, Middle and Later Saxon sites for comparison. Um, we got 10 individuals in total, four of which I said were from, were from Oakington. So it's, it's small scale um, by today's standards, but at that time, back in 2016, when it was published, that was quite a big project. One of the things that we were able to do with that is to, is to combine the archaeology and the DNA together. And it was really a, quite an early attempt to do that in, in a published format for an ancient DNA paper. And what we identified was that there were some interesting sort of mini patterns, if you like, taking place between these four individuals, all of which were women. Were women. That wasn't by design um, because we hadn't, we weren't entirely clear on the, the biological sex of, of some of those individuals at the point of sampling and actually sent quite a large number of samples um, in to be analysed. And these ones gave us the best over 95% coverage for the genetics. What this showed really is that some individuals could be characterised but as being from continental Northern Europe, those in red um, illustrated on the slide. And some individuals could be identified as being closer genetically to a sort of indigenous or uh, Western British and Irish ancestry. Uh, grave one in blue there is one of the individuals that is most likely to be Western British or Irish or have Western British Irish ancestry. And interestingly, she is also the individual who's buried with uh, objects that you might characterise as the most Anglo-Saxon, although I realise that there is no such thing as the most Anglo-Saxon. Um, so this is a issue was buried with a cruciform, any in a brooch, bead, strap end, buckles and knife. So it's interesting that there's almost a contrast there in the way that we might expect people to be buried in the way they were. And that was something that we could explore a little bit in this paper and in the sort of subsequent discussions around it. Burial 96 there, which I highlighted in green, was a hybrid of those two uh, genotypes. And that again was quite interesting because some of the previous archaeological discourse had suggested that when there was no interbreeding or very limited or controlled interbreeding through the process of apartheid between um, a migrating or incoming continental Northern European population, a surviving indigenous Western British Irish population. And so in this sample of four, we end up bringing some quite big um, points up, but really four people in any archaeological conversation isn't enough to, to hang those sort of big ideas from. 
So it was very evident that what we needed to do was explore this in, in much more depth. And that's where we come to the new project. This was published in November 2022. We sampled 458 individuals from across North and Western, uh, Northwestern Europe. 277 were from early medieval England, and that included 11 early Anglo-Saxon cemeteries, as we might characterise them, because of the nature of the material culture and their location on the east coast of Britain. So that included Dover Buckland, East Street, Polhill, Ely, Hatherdean Close, Oakington, uh, Lake and Heath, West Heselton, um, Appledown and Rookery Hill, um, West Sussex, as well as Worth Matravers. So a real a nice mixture there of, of well excavated, well reported and more recent excavations that we were able to sample and ongoing stuff, um, which was which was fun. It was good to collect those samples. This is what those samples look like on a distribution map of the UK, primarily focused on the, the east coast of, of England and then um, northwestern Europe. So we can see that. And on the bottom there, you can see the chronological basis of those individuals as well. So again, primarily from that immediately post-Roman period, with some individuals stretching back into the, into the first millennium AD. When we plot those, and this is the geneticist's um, statistical approach to identifying how these individuals might be characterised as, as either Western British Irish or, or continental Northern European. And so that is, a, is it, the, the results of, of the genetic um, assessment and then compared with, with modern populations uh, and plotted onto this principal component analysis chart to look at um, comparability of those individuals. And what this suggests was from our sample as a whole, um, 74 plus or minus 2% uh, of the net genetics was of continental Northern European ancestry, which is quite a significant amount, and not that dissimilar to, to that that was identified in the first 2016 paper. We're able to, to explore this in depth by comparison to the recently published Patterson et al. paper and the previous Beaker People's paper um, to look at Bronze Age um, and Iron Age genetics and compare them to the early Middle Ages. And that's really where you can see quite a shift. And we have a nice chart here, which, do, which shows that uh, in a sort of linear two-dimensional form. The zero at the bottom there is um, no continental Northern European ancestry as we've identified it from our sample. And one is 100%. And you can see a sort of range um, there from the Bronze Age all the way through to the early Middle Ages with the most diversity in the early Middle Ages. I've characterised that in, in several slides next, which show it best for those of more archaeological mind than, than genetics or statistics. So the first slide shows um, all the individuals um, that have been sampled from ancient DNA from, um, from um, the UK. Um, and in this case, then we've got blue, which illustrates Western British Irish ancestry, and red that illustrates um, Northern, continental Northern European ancestry. So this is the Bronze Age, this is the Iron Age, and this is the early Middle Ages. And you can see a, a very significant transformation um, on the east coast of England there. We can explore that uh, regionally and we can explore that on a cemetery level. Um, and so what I've done here is put together some pie charts to show the distribution or difference between, in this case, continental Northern European ancestry um, in red again. And the pie chart there shows the proportion of uh, individuals from those cemeteries that have that ancestry. And you can see it's it, the, the largest proportion is on the east coast of, of England with a greater proportion on uh, the south coast there of um, Western British Irish ancestry, potentially even a, a larger amount of that Western British Irish ancestry as we move west across the, the, the UK. So that's a very interesting observation, um, possibly not one we wouldn't necessarily expect, but of course we haven't been able to explore that with, with genetics before. What we've also put on there is, is green and, and the green um, is, is a little bit of French ancestry that's evident. And you can have both continental Northern European ancestry and French Iron Age ancestry, and both Western British Irish and um, Iron Age French ancestry as well. So it's interesting to see that starting to appear in those samples. Okay. So what can we do with this data? We can explore it, as I said, on the cemetery level, but we can also explore it um, 
in an individual level, we can look at individual graves and their, and their genetic components. And there's a number of, of conversations that have taken place around biological sex and gender in the early Middle Ages. And some of our individuals had, had formed part of that, that conversation. So notably, West Heselton Grave 184 and 144 were both, uh, both biologically or skeletally identified as, as female but their genetics indicates that they were male. Both individuals were found with, with knives, spearheads, shield bosses. So that sort of almost puts that, that got back again to where it, where it started. And at Dover Buckland, we've got 383, um, 350 and 281, which were um, buried with artifacts we might normally associate with female dress, but had skeletally been identified as possibly male. These individuals, were female um, genetically. I don't think that we should completely run in the opposite direction and say that these five individuals demonstrate that there was no diversity in the sex gender um, expression in the Anglo-Saxon burial rite or the early Anglo-Saxon burial rite. Um, and this individual grave 122 from West Heselton, which we flagged up in, in the current archaeology issue, sort of demonstrates that. Uh, this individual was 12 to 15 years old, buried at West Heselton, and uh, genetically identified as a young male, um, whereas they had been identified as, as female in the, in the archaeological report. He was found with this small equal armed brooch, some beads and a knife. Um, and the brooch tends to put this individual as very early in, in the sort of migration event um, scenario. You know, possibly as early as, as, as the middle of the 5th century. So it may be that this is a result of age or um, the sort of chronological point where a fully developed uh, early East Coast, early Anglo-Saxon burial rite hasn't yet emerged as we understand it. It's on its way. Um, so we probably need to be more nuanced than just jumping straight into uh, biological sex gender um, discourses here and think quite a lot about the context of, of how these individuals uh, might be found but certainly I think it gives us a lot of potential to explore that uh, in depth across the whole collection which is fun. So from our national sample then we were, we were able to um, because of the size of the sample we we're able to explore the statistics of, of how this works with um, we'll be able to look at individuals as grave goods, we'll be able to look at individuals against age, sex, um, and biological um, gender as well. Um, and so we've got uh, here what we can suggest then is that there is some significance, according to grave goods, between continental Northern European and Western British ancestry, okay? And that, that is almost certainly seen in women's graves but there's a difference between the practice uh, in the north and the south of our sample, um, and that there's a, a difference in it between uh, women buried with brooches and not buried with brooches. And that was sort of something that was quite interesting to explore. So I'm going to look at that in a little bit more depth. So um, one of the things that that suggests then is that there's very little difference between men buried with, with weapons. And that's obviously something, again, that's been flagged up in, in previous archaeological conversation, which might have identified men with weapons as being of likely migrant stock. On the left here, I've got Eastry, um, grave 37 from Kent. And this individual was buried under a, a barrow, a small barrow with a ring ditch around it, and was interred with a sea axe that possibly dates this as late 6th or, or early 7th century. What's interesting about it is that is the genetics comes up as almost entirely Western British Irish ancestry, despite the prominence of this burial and the ancestry that we identified. On the right hand side, I've got West Heselton from Yorkshire. We've, where I've flagged up um, the weapon burials and the object burials within that and, this, and the individuals that have been um, tested genetically. I think some 30 or 40 individuals we were able to test from West Helson. There's quite a lot of diversity present within there. But what was interesting is that it was men with continental Northern European ancestry were more likely to have weapons than men without continental Northern European ancestry. So it's 
quite clearly some sort of local decision making taking place about who does and hasn't, doesn't have weapons in the mortuary process. And I'll explore that in a little bit more depth um, later on. We can see regional patterns. So for example, in Kent, there is no difference according to any of the criteria that we assessed according to ancestry. Whereas in East Anglia, it appears to be according to, to grave goods and in women's graves in particular, that there is difference in, in, in burial practice. That isn't true across all sites. This is Oakington, the site that I've been excavating. Um, and I wanted to sort of flag this up in particular because we have a, a number of quite prominent individuals that have mixed ancestry or predominantly Western British Irish ancestry. Um, this individual particularly is a woman who was probably buried in a, under a small barrow um, with a, a small silver disc brooch and some amber beads and a chatelaine and belt hanging set. Um, and she was buried with a completely articulated cow as well. She is about 60% Western British Irish ancestry and about 30% continental Northern European ancestry. So that was sort of interesting. She's also one of the few individuals in this site that we've identified as having any biological relationships with anybody else in the site. And that's again, something I'll, I'll flag up a bit later. We can see patterns across different sites. So this is Hatherdean Close, um, which is just outside Cambridge, uh, Cherry Hinton. And we can see here in this site, it is more likely that individuals of uh, Western British Irish ancestry are found without grave goods at all. And actually, it seems to be that this pattern is so stark at um, Hatherdean Close as it's driving the rest of the statistics for East Anglia and really pulling it in that direction of, of, of contrast, of difference. So it's interesting, again, that that does seem to be a local pattern where individual communities are choosing to bury their dead in particular ways according to the the ideas that they have about how that community is is divided and separated uh, and operates at west heselton um, again what we have here is our um, our difference in, in weapon burials and we can we used um, wilkinson rank sum analysis to identify that difference um, where it flags up a slight um, significance to men with weapons with continental northern European ancestry and men with Western British Irish ancestry, ancestry without weapons. So um, this is a, a spatial view of, of West Hazleton to see the difference in the organisation of that site with large grave plots at um, A, B, C and D. If I then put the, the grave goods on top of that, you can see that in the burial area that I've identified as A, um, based on its sort of um, location and the density of burials, um, there is a group uh, with a sort of T-shape of, of, of weapon burials in the middle of it, which have male biological sex um, and, and those objects, which include spears and shields and, and swords and that sort of thing. There are a number of, of burials which I've highlighted there in yellow, which have a single weapon or spear. And again, most of those are buried in that sort of um, central area of, of cluster A. We can then start to apply or start to look at where the, the genetics sits in there as well. And on the right hand side, I've, I've brought in the picture of the genetics and we can see highlighted in orange squares, those individuals that are biologically related to each other. And this is usually first or second degree at this stage of analysis. So the individuals are sort of sons and fathers and that sort of thing, um, possibly brothers as well. Um, so what we can see there, I think, hopefully, is that there is a greater density of individuals that are related to each other within that cluster, within the A area of um, the, a, the A plot. So it looks like, very clearly, the reason for this statistical um, tendency towards men with continental Northern European ancestry being buried with weapons at um, West Heselton is more likely to be driven by a single family group that are choosing that particular expression, possibly to highlight who they are within that community and are burying their dead in the very central area of the largest burial plot in, in West Heselton. It may be that that expression of, of relationships of biological similarity is more important than ethnicity. And we have to note that burial 77, which is right in the center of, of plot B, is probably the most prominent burial in that space. There's a, a male buried with a, a, a wet stone or a polishing stone. Um, 
so not a weapon burial, but has Western British Irish ancestry. Okay. This is in contrast, as I just mentioned, to, to Oakington, where we just don't see those pans. And that's interesting. So we were exploring, and one of the things we flagged up in current archaeology articles um, is the, the relationships are evident in some of these sites, which we have quite a lot of samples for. Dover Buckland is the most obvious example. We took 74 samples from Dover. We we're able to explore in depth some quite significant biological relationships. So this is the, uh, the distribution of those samples and artifacts across um, Dover Buckland. And there are no patterns against male grave goods or female grave goods against sex um, or the presence of weapons or, or brooches. The, the likelihood of someone being Western British Irish or continental Northern European or a mixture of those two is equal against all of those different criteria. But what is quite interesting is that we're able to spot some quite detailed family histories. Um, and this is on the top here, you can see a family history chart. Uh, that indicates those first degree relationships between um, fathers and mothers and, and sons and daughters all the way through. Um, and you can see the incoming, um, in this case, incoming Western British Irish ancestry. So the red indicates that this family starts off with its first uh, generation. It's actually the second line on there, which are identified burials. So that is our first generation of this family who are primarily of continental Northern European ancestry, or entirely of continental Northern European ancestry. And then in the second generation, we have on the right hand side, a male, a male burial, and he um, has a sexual relationship with a female and they have children. And that, that female has um, Western British Irish ancestry, 100% Western British Irish ancestry. So all of their children are a mixture, a hybrid of those two. And it's interesting, it's really at this point, later down in those family trees, where we start to see significant numbers of artefacts appearing as part of the burial assemblage. It's just one family, but it does suggest that there's a, a, a little bit of a time distance to develop those significant burial assemblages. What is interesting about this is that we can then plot where those individuals are buried onto the Dover Buckland site. And this illustration at the bottom shows where our first, second, third and fourth generation individuals are. Um, and we've got red to indicate 100% CNE ancestry. And then we've got the, the mixed colour there to show um, those that mixing hybrid um, groups. What I quite like about this illustration is it shows that we've got a cluster of individuals right in the middle, you can see there with 288, 284, 291, who are related to each other, who are buried in very, very close proximity. And then we have a single individual. So this is burial number, if I get this right, uh, 246, who is a woman. And she is buried away from the group in this little cluster to the top here. One of her children, the youngest of her children to die, is buried back in this original cluster again, next to her grandparents. So her grandfather and her aunts, okay? And this lady's oldest children, the children who live the longest rather, are buried next to her, or close proximity to her in this new burial space. So it suggests we have a sort of a degree of um, well, exogamous in terms of its family commitment, but endogamous in terms of the community marriage relationship where this woman is marrying out of her immediate um, cluster into a new space and then is being buried probably by her children or her new husband in his family burial space. So we can really start to drill down into micro histories and micro histories that I think are quite important because they seem to be driving cultural change like for example the adoption of um, grave goods or this sort of movement and, and hybridization of the, of the of the biology of the people of the east coast of England. We can also spot individuals, individuals that tell really quite important stories. Um, so this individual here is burial 250 from Dover Buckland as well 
she's buried just just in front of this giant blue arrow that I've put there. She was found with one of the wealthiest burial cemeteries in, in Dover Buckland, and it's a pretty wealthy cemetery, so that's, that's saying something um, quite significant. One of the artefacts that she found was with this um, bracteate, gold bracteate, which you can see in the photograph, just the bottom left there, um, which is on the string of, of multicolored glass beads. The bracteate is, um, is described as something that could either be from, from Norway or locally produced in Kent. The style is quite is a little bit looser than you might expect in those Norwegian bracteates. So it's a possibility that it comes from either place. What's interesting about her is that she has a uh, mitochondrial haplotype, um, which is unique to that symmetry. What that means is from those individuals that we sampled, she doesn't have any female biological relationships. Her mum is not there, her aunts are not there, her sisters are not there, and daughters are not there either from our sample group. The isotopic analysis that, that Sam Leggett conducted also indicates that she was born elsewhere um, and that she moved um, at some point in her uh, late teens, probably, or early adulthood. And so what is likely, I suspect, from, from all of this evidence is that she is an example of exogamous marriage, where she's moved from somewhere like Norway, from certainly continental Northern Europe, um, and has moved for marriage into a wealthy family in Kent. And possibly we can start to talk about that bracteate either as being a gift from the family that she's leaving behind, or something that's been made by her new family in Kent to resemble and comfort her in her new home, because it resembles the sorts of material and artifacts or, or objects, jewelry that she might have worn or seen um, at home. And so that's quite interesting. It does very nicely link artifacts, identity and, and movement, which is obviously something that archaeologists have talked about for quite a long time. So I quite like that, the story that that individual tells. We can also see um, some tragedies, which again are quite difficult to spot archaeologically otherwise, even though you might be aware that they have to have existed. So this is Lakenheath from East Anglia, where we have um, a burial here of two siblings who died as children. The, the boy is slightly older, the uh, boy on the left-hand side is slightly older than the, than the girl. And just a few yards away is this more elderly male, um, skeletally over 45. Um, and so it's likely that he died or he died sometime after they did. They died together and we buried together. And so we could reason, um, probably not um, uncomfortably, that he probably buried these two individuals, his children, uh, in the grave. So that's interesting. You know, you ask who buries the dead? Well, we might even be able to tell you at this point, which is quite fun. And then one of the, the more famous burials that we're able to discuss in the current archaeological article and in the popular press was, was now being called Updown Girl because of that. Um, she is buried in um, Eastry in Burial 47, which I've identified there as yellow, right in the centre of our, of our sample cluster. And she has somewhere between 30 and 40 percent West African ancestry through her male line. And what's really interesting about her, she's also a girl, she's aged around about 10 to 12. What's really interesting about her is her female ancestors, her aunts and great aunts, are buried in close proximity to her. So there's a difference between the way that her biology, her male side and the female side are working within the cemetery. And she's buried in a way that's not untypical for a young girl um, in a Kentish cemetery with a, um, she's got a spoon and she's got a comb and she's got a wheel turned pot. Okay, so that's quite interesting, I think, anyway. Okay, so we've got some significant patterns there around the number of graves with CNE ancestry and their distribution across the UK, either you know, focusing primarily on the East Coast and that difference um, regionally. We've got no real sex basis according to ancestry. So if we can identify a continuous migration event, men and women are migrating in equal numbers. Um, according to, to our sample size. And we can see there is some post-mortem emphasis on female artefacts and brooches, although I, I'm not sure we've really got to the bottom of this. And, I, and one of the things that strikes me is that, that 
one of the significant patterns we're seeing amongst the individuals is the sort of marriage connections. And what's usually the case is that the Western British Irish females are underrepresented proportionally within these sites. So it's likely that they're marrying into male lineages represented by these early Anglo-Saxon communities. So it might be not that ethnicity is the driving force between their uh, burial practice, but that marriage relationship is the driving force behind it. So I think we're going to have to develop quite a careful discourse about the, the exact nature of, of this sort of pattern. There are significant regional and local patterns taking place with, with different communities making different decisions. Um, and I think, as I've sort of emphasised throughout this, family is providing that social vehicle for, for integration or separation, as we see at, at Hatherdean. So I think perhaps to these communities, the people that live with you, the people you eat with, the people you defend your farm with and have children with are probably the most significant people in your immediate life. And so it's interesting that identity seems to focus around that family identity rather than ethnicity when they're making those mortuary displays. So uh, we could have some questions, but actually I thought what I would do is, is, is quickly skip into, into the second part because we, we published all of this one uh, quite widely. Nature attracts a, a large number of, of press interests um, and we published the current archaeology very, um, articles very deliberately to, to allow us some influence over that media discourse. And so what I want to do is sort of explore that a little bit within this particular context. And again, really in that sort of just pre-COVID, possibly um, towards the, the first lockdown, there are a number of publications that, that came out that start to question the validity of um, using genetic data to explore migration questions in, in archaeological um, academic study. Um, Susan Harkenbeck is, is one such example, and she, she published a paper in, in World Archaeology that sort of is titled uh, Genetics, Archaeology and the Far Right, and, and makes us think very much about the public impact of, of, of the work that we are doing. Um, we've got a number of papers, of other papers, including Catherine Freeman and Danny Hoffman, who also in the same issue of, of World Archaeology um, are, well, first off, they're, they're calling the genetic study of, of migrations and ethnicities more like genetic astrology than any form of, of population history. Um, but also using um, references, as does Susan Harkenbeck, to a number of far-right websites that discuss genetics and migration history to, to foreground white power um, identities and, and sort of justify their political views. And sort of highlighting the negativity of that and the awareness that the archaeological community should have. There's also something that James Harland in his recent book, which is a historiography of the early Anglo-Saxon migration, um, really, really flags up and really does in a, a quite a dramatic way. So he describes this as the low hum of threatening political discourse that has crescendoed while he was doing his, his PhD in writing his, his book. And I think that is quite dramatic because this has been an issue for probably quite a lot longer than, than James Holland has been, been aware of. And that idea, that sort of building up into a storm, a crescendo, is actually something that the, the far right um, themselves do. They call it the coming storm, which has actually been the title of some popular BBC Radio 4 shows recently that talk about the sort of these cultural wars that are appearing out of the United States and, and in, in the UK. So it's also some of this, this work is a little bit contrary, some of it is contradictory, but also perhaps using the same sort of threatening discourse. I think the reason for that is really that dealing with migration in popular discourse is extremely difficult, has been highlighted with um, conversations about Roman um, mobility patterns um, and African ancestry. So, you know, do we have any positive stories about the press? And we were thinking quite carefully about this when we were putting together our, um, our, our media strategy. These are the big picture ideas from the Daily Express about migration in popular conversation. And it's all negative, migrants steal our jobs. 
uh, you know, migrants go to prison for all sorts of horrible things. Okay, and yet we also have a culture of of, of reflecting on and recognise the achievement of individual migrants. So I've highlighted a few scientists and musicians. Um, politicians and even members of the royal family who who are famously migrant uh, and yet uh, whose positive contribution to society and culture is is well recognized and what we can see is a, a conversation here uh, so what we can see then really is a, a is a um a tale of two media coverages. Uh, we've got migration, not conquest, uh, takes over England. And this is this is the story that was picked up upon um, by New Scientist, uh, or by Science Magazine, um, based on the, the press release that was put out by, by Nature. Okay, so we had Nature put out a first press release, and then we were able to put out a series of second press releases around the current archaeology issue um, focusing on those individuals. And what we wanted to do is allow there to be a conversation about the science and the genetics, but also then to, to use this idea of popular individuals to explore the people that we could see, that we could see biologically there as well. So here we go, um, flagging up some of those individuals in, in the current archaeology issue. So in the first instance, then, um, we, the Mail Online um, publishes an absolutely awful article. Um, and this article um, looks at the, the sort of big headlines of the genetics. So Anglo-Saxons were only 24% English. I mean, this is obviously a nonsense, as the idea of the English didn't exist in the early Middle Ages. And it takes the, the numbers and, and doesn't understand them. At the end of the article, there's this little information box, which, which asks, what was Britain like in the 14th century? Um, only a thousand years wrong in terms of the chronology of this article. So very poorly researched. And what's interesting about that is that we can see some themes in the comments that took place underneath it. This attracted 323 comments online, which is a lot. And those themes included correcting the article, because the frame is just wrong, the error is, is evident. Humour, debating the facts and British history and identity. And then modern migration, um, and then a few racist and white ring views that I want to explore, because we flagged up that as, a, as, as an issue. So here we go, correcting the article, a number of, of comments. I'm not going to go through each one, but there's comments then saying things like, I'm sorry, where did the Saxons come from? Um, questioning what they're saying. An interesting article spoiled only by the, the, the inept Daily Mail reporters, uh, dark ages in the 14th century, really? And then the Daily Mail has a system where you can up or down uh, comments. And in this case, these are upped by 24 individuals and nobody has downvoted it. Okay. And the higher up, the more upvotes you get, the higher up on that list, on that hierarchy of 300 or so articles you get. So that's something that is wanting, people want to achieve is those, is those very positive situations, those very positive reviews. So Humour then. So they were trying to escape the effects of Europe even then, okay, plus 16, minus four. I particularly like the, the, the historical humour. I blame Vortigern, plus seven. It's quite, quite a good knowledge going on there, uh, which is interesting. And then a uh, humour that we might not enjoy necessarily because of its flavour or taste, but any dinghies found in the grave, this seems to be something that people engaged with, plus 31 individuals, plus five people didn't agree with it. OK, then we've got debating the facts of, of British history and British identity. So describing the fact that Germany didn't exist until 1871, so they couldn't have been Germans quite right. OK, telling us something we didn't know about our, since our school days and this kind of stuff. So really sort of exploring both the point of it and, and how it contributes to, to history. And then modern migration is a theme that appears throughout these things. So don't tell the Brexit loons. It doesn't excuse today's mass migration to this country, plus 44, okay. And then right-wing and racist views. Um, so no, it will never, it will never mix stop talking lies, people trying to deny the sort of genetic variation of the past. Um, the English are illegal immigrants, you couldn't make this up. 
But what's interesting about these ones is they get very low numbers of upvotes and often quite high numbers of downvotes. So they are being commented on themselves by the readers of, of the Daily Mail. In response to the, um, the current archaeology article, we see um, a, a piece that actually um, the journalist spent quite a lot of time talking to us about. He took two or three days to write it. He came back with comments and questions. And we get a much more accurate depiction of, of the archaeology, which is quite fun. This has 106 shares, okay, um, and we can explore some of those. So we've got some negative um, views, total rubbish, plus eight, minus five. They're trying to change history as usual, plus 11, minus three. I suspect, is it not the job of archaeologists and historians to, to rewrite history, to rethink about it? It's complexity. Absolute nonsense, plus 664, minus 332. And that attracted a lot of sub-comments. So lots of people commented on that one. In particular, you can you end up with a sort of um, the scroll down bar, um, which is part of uh, why and, and sarcasm and people saying down with science and stuff like that. So it really did um, galvanise or a, a sort of debate or conversation. Got a lot of people providing confirmative responses. People were moving around quite a lot. They were traders, they travelled, of course they did, we shouldn't be surprised. And people being positive about archaeology, it fascinates me, which is quite nice given quite a lot of archaeologists' experience of the Daily Mail. We then saw uh, the Times presenting coverage of both pieces again. So we're starting off with Anglo-Saxons were looking for a new home, a piece by Jack Blackburn. And again, we can see a number of themes developing. We can see humour, debating the facts of British history and identity, modern migration and racism. So actually having a very similar type of conversation to the ones we see in the Daily Mail, although perhaps in a slightly more in-depth fashion. So again, in this one, you can, you can support, but you can't downvote um, pieces. So we can see um, up in green, the numbers of people who have said you know, positive thumbs up to the Daily Mail comment, uh, sorry, the Times comments that people have made here. So why don't they go back to where they came from? Referring to the Anglo-Saxons, of course, 38. As a Celt, I propose we fire them to Rwanda. Okay, and this humour is very much about dealing with modern political challenges and modern um, problems, which is an interesting thing to observe. It sounds as if most of us can now apply for European Union passports. Okay, and then a debate. So you could you can see a comment, and then people referring to those comments here. And this one is discussing in depth the sort of difference between. Um, the Brits and the Celts and the humour value in there as well. Okay, and people then coming up with things like, no, the Celts don't exist, they're a Victorian fantasy, Anglo-Saxons built Britain. It's actually not necessarily, you think you might not necessarily um, find outside of a first year undergraduate archaeology course. We again have this debating the facts of, of British history. Okay, while I cannot dispute the results of this study based on DNA evidence, the Anglo-Saxon Dukes certainly raided Britain for the years prior to immigration after Roman legions were withdrawn. The Romans built 11 forts along the Saxon shore to defend the coast of the province against Britain. So quite a detailed conversation about those facts. And again, we can have a discourse about that where people are asking questions and exploring it through conversation. We even have a, a quite an interesting one about the about presentism. So really, even getting into into the theory of, of historical research, um, and then people sort of questioning the nature of the study or its um, results. And then more modern migration again. So people are using it to frame a conversation about other news articles that are taking place that week or, or that day. And that's something I've seen before when I've looked at these sorts of comments, uh, in particular around things like the Hillbrid Hillsborough disaster, where quite complicated and difficult subjects are being reduced down to a way that can be have, people can have a conversation around them using humour and archaeology to help frame that conversation. And then in the Times as well, a little bit of right-wing racism. I loved reading, uh, to read the urban lefties making comments about the immigration to our country. Okay, but very similar to, to what we're seeing in the Daily Mail um, or Mail Online versions. We're getting very few positive affirmations taking place for these right-wing views. 
And then around the current archaeology article, so again, this is now the individuals rather than the bigger scientific picture. We again see humour debating um, the facts of it, modern migration, which becomes quite a significant conversation in this one, especially galvanised by Up Down Girl, and then some racist and right wing views as well. Um, so the frame of the article uh, is, is brought into question. OK, um, in the far past, the entire population of Britain came out of Africa in response to people questioning where any of this came from in the first place and whether we should be surprised at that result. Uh, we have this conversation here where people are questioning how archaeology is framed in the media. It sounds like the sort of history the BBC likes to present. Sparse evidence, very confident about the science, enthusiastic projections from very little. And I think that's very interesting. It, I think it, it says a lot about how we should think about how archaeology is presented in, in the popular press and in the popular media, um, but possibly also people's prejudices. Uh, debating British history and race identity um, was a particular um, theme that was coming out, galvanised again by Up Down Girl, who was at the headpiece of, of all of those articles. Okay, that's, that's interesting. Um, and then a whole conversation about a few Black Africans present in the Britain is not diversity and what that means. No, they didn't. Yes, they did. This kind of stuff. Okay. Um, it's, it's sort of interesting to go through these things. Um, and then a complicated conversation about exactly where um, they come from whether this individual's grandfather, who was probably the ancestor who had West African um, and uh, originated from West Africa, whether he was late Roman or whether he was late 6th or 7th century, whether connected to Byzantium and how that then might have worked across the Sahara. And that is a very interesting conversation because although the facts are not the same as the ones we're necessarily writing up currently for, um, for publication, the sort of broader concepts of dating and working out locations and how that connection could have worked across into uh, across the Sahara and into North Africa and Byzantium is a very interesting part of, of the history of how that genetics might have got into the UK. And then humour, I imagine this girl came across from France in an inflatable coracle. Okay, again, you might not agree with it in, in terms of its taste, um, but I think it adds a bit of fun to this and deals with some quite difficult concepts. I like in particular, archaeologists believe she may have been living in an up-down world, but she never met a backstreet guy, obviously referring then uh, to Billy Joel's um, famous Uptown Girl um, song. So it gave us a theme tune, which is, which is quite good. We'll see a little bit of, of racism and people were commenting to this. So what we've got at the top here is uh, this comment violated the, the Times policy. It's been deleted. But what you can see is the responses to that. And people you know, putting quite robust responses when, when racism is presented, as well as reporting the, um, the comment to, to moderators. And that's quite, quite nice to see. I think this comment clearly um, talked about one of these sort of Aryan myths that... Um, that are about in the, in the, in the sort of right-wing discourse. Um, and that is, is robustly removed um, by a number of commentators, and I've put, the, put them there, which is, which is good. So, so to conclude that part two part of, of the conversation then, you know, racism is present. We can't escape from that. It is there, um, okay? But then it is part of um, modern social discourse. Uh, we may not like it, but it's there. What was encouraging was that it's often met with rebuke and negative comments about the archaeology, the findings, their interpretation, or negative comments that bring on board racism are also derided by a, more, a greater majority of people making those comments. Many readers and commentators made sense of what they see uh, within a contemporary frame, so using uh, the archaeology to understand modern events or modern events to understand the archaeology and they apply a humor to it even if we individually don't necessarily agree with the tone or taste of that it's a way of, of diluting some quite serious problems there's also some quite genuine historical engagement and dialogue so i don't think there is so much reason to be pessimistic as is presented by those three papers that i cited previously 
I don't think we should run straight into um, right wing um, d discourse uh, when trying to understand the impact of archaeological research. What's clear here is that we're able to have a, a, a sophisticated conversation, um, if not um, an informed conversation, within the middle ground. Um, and that's quite important, I think. What we need to be aware of is that those articles that we published and the current archaeology article in particular was, um, according to my press office, in reach of over 200 million individuals. Now, what that means in terms of, of, of British readers is that everybody could have come across those articles four or five times during the course of a given week. And we managed to keep that story in the press for almost a month in various different of different ways and places. So really able to create a conversation that was taking place all over um, the UK and overseas as well. Quite a lot of our articles were published in the continent and in America. So I don't believe that we should be judged on how uh, we impact the right, but possibly how um, we have a wider engagement with an audience that can correct that right and then can really, really contribute to, to social discourse. Okay, thank you very much. I shall end my presentation there. And if we've got time for questions, then I'll happily take some. Um, thank you very much, Duncan. Um, a, a fascinating paper in, in sort of two halves. Um, uh, if there are questions from members of the audience, if you'd like to uh, type them into the chat, um, I will uh, pick them up and uh, convey them to, to Duncan. Do you want to stop sharing screen, Duncan, so that we can sort of see you uh, in full life, so to speak? Yeah, I can uh, do that. There we go. I, can, can I just make, um, well, I, there's one question in the chat already. There's uh, one question that I wanted to raise with you before opening it up more broadly. And that um, I think the uh, if just focusing on the the sort of archaeology and genetics in the first half, which I think is really fascinating, and it really uh, is the beginning of a transformation of the subject by integrating the two things. Um, the the one thing that I I have a little bit of difficulty with um, is the terminology we use for these um, sort of genetic groupings, and you know, as a Romanist. Uh, when you're talking about um, sort of Western British Irish, uh, that's actually presumably the pre-existing population that occupied the whole of uh, sort of lowland Britain uh, in the Roman period. And I, I wonder whether there are issues around uh, how we um, label those genetic groups that might actually help with um, some of the broader uh, public discourse on this. Mm. Thanks. I think that's a good question. It's certainly something that, that we need to talk about. Um, we spent a huge amount of time discussing those labels. Um, it was probably the single thing that we, we spoke about most when we came to write up the paper. Um, and we, we needed to remove um, all the sort of usual problems associated with them. Now, how do you describe, you know, how do you attach uh, a label to, to any of this? And we, we needed to remove ethnic labels, yep. which is why we ended up with continental Northern European. Because it, it, you know, that's where geographically that genetics is, is primarily located. Um, and um, Western British Irish, again, because it, it sort of carries and conveys that idea of um, ingenuity or indigenousness um, without putting an ethnic label on it. And so it, it creates that, that contrast. Um, uh, and actually, it was, it was something that was flagged up a number of times um, in, the, in the comments in the current archaeology article quite positively that we managed to do that. Um, and by the reviewers of, of, of Nature, who, who understood the, the sort of um, sensitive nature of using ethnic labels. So, yes, but we, you know, I, you know, I can understand that, that there's going to be quite a lot of concern around any label we choose. Um, and I certainly respect your, what you're saying there. Um, but I certainly wouldn't have wanted to say things like you know, Romano-British because oh, that's not, that's no, no. It, would, it would sort of create more problems than it solves. And of course, what we also needed to remove was the sort of 
the archaeological assumptions that we might make. So there is no indication that because someone is Western British Irish in the genetics that they originated from anywhere near the cemetery. They may have come from Western okay. Britain or Ireland, yeah. you know, and actually Sam Leggett's isotope data is suggesting that there's quite a lot of internal mobility within yeah. the United Kingdom as well. So what we need to do is really neutralise and allow um, a, a sort of scientific conversation to take place around those, those sample those labels. And I just wonder whether there is, uh, in the way you very helpfully sort of pulled out uh, other aspects of the debate, um, there isn't, uh, it's not simply for individuals writing papers, but there is actually an area for debate within the subject of how we uh, develop these terminologies, rightly, I think, avoiding the sort of ethnic and historical uh, things. Uh, can we agree a, a sort of neutral terminology, if you like? That, that's probably a, a, enough from me. But um, there are a, a, a few questions coming in. Um, uh, Penelope Walton Rogers is asking, as a great tool, and ask whether you can distinguish um, the uh, any Scandinavian element in the uh, presumably continental Northern European and uh, distinguish that from uh, further south and from the French ancestry. Yeah, so we can distinguish the French Irish ancestry and the continental Northern European ancestry. The French ancestry appears to come so later and affects all of the samples, but um, predominantly the, the sort of Kent and the south coast of, of, of Britain. Um, it's interesting because it's not that dissimilar to, to what Vera Everson was talking about um, yeah. when she was writing about her Kentish cemeteries and, and there yeah. being a very significant Frankish component. But what's interesting in the in the stats is that when you compare that with our broader modern population and the um, sort of ancient population going up to and beyond 1000 AD, is that that increases. And, and in fact, the, the French component ends up eclipsing the um, continental Northern European component in the in modern um, British ancestry. So yeah, that's the, that French ancestry is really, really significant. In terms of Scandinavian, it's quite difficult to distinguish. I think the, the what, what is very obvious is that genetics in combination with, with really good isotope data is going to be the way that we can explore that in more detail because you can say these people from genetically broadly have ancestry over here but they are either first generation migrants themselves or not and very specifically they, those locations and I think that's going to be the way that we we really end up with quite powerful results is, is combining good quality radiocarbon dates isotopic data and genetic data and then we can really start talking about individuals in that way. Um, there's a, a comment for question from uh, Malik Lewin here uh, saying he assumed that uh, the burial tradition in late Roman Britain was uh, in humation and it then moved to cremation. And he's asking how the cremation element sort of fits into uh, what you're doing. Mm. Well, cremation is very difficult to get genetics from, unfortunately. Although there is there is some some recent um, PhD work coming out of Durham that is, is getting quite good isotope data out of of cremation, and that's and that's very promising in terms of both the things that I've just said, really, where we can see that there is significant amounts of mobility from within the UK, evident within within that cremation data, and we and also that we cannot make the assumption that because cremations are more common on the pop, um, on the continent that they actually contain individuals that are themselves also 100% um, genetically or um, geographically from the continent and quite a lot of those individuals isotopes were have been local so I think that's quite interesting I think, I think there's a lot to come out of cremations we're not quite there yet um then there's a uh, from giant to press um assume a hundred of the individuals were not uh, related there would have been 400 unrelated grandparents. Of these, one was from Africa. Um, would you think that one in 400, 0.25% African was more or less in line with the ethnic composition of early medieval uh, area? Um, okay, so the genetics is, is not mm. Mendelian. Um, so if you go for, um, so up there and go in particular, and actually we have, um, if you look at the, the tables that we've got at the back of the nature paper, 
one of the individuals from Worth Matraverse, a young boy, is also has the same sort of 30 to 40 percent West African ancestry. Um, and that's that's sort of that's quite interesting that we've got two individuals within what you might describe as two separate cultural zones within within England. Um, now, you if you have um, if you have a parent, two parents, you're you are fifty percent both of those, okay. But the component of your parents' genetics that is their parent or their grandparent within you may not be twenty five percent because it's going to be a random amount of the 50% that is that person's. And so we have to be quite careful when exploring um, those types of, of proportions, um, really. And that's why, in my understanding as an archaeologist, that's why it's quite difficult to move beyond first and second generation using this type of genetics at the moment, although that is really opening up quite a lot. Um, and I've just, in the process of sending up more samples to, um, to Max Planck so that we can explore this in more detail. I'm really interested in the fact that Oakington and, and Dover Buckland are really different, and that we've got loads of biological relationships with Dover, and almost none at Oakington, yet we have the same proportion of the population of those cemeteries sampled. So we should have a similar amount. Um, so we've now sampled 100% of the, the, new, the 94 excavation at Dover Buckland and of the Oakington um, cemeteries for analysis. And we should end up getting an extremely good coverage and, and with new methods that are coming out all the time, we should be able to get into fourth or fifth um, degree biological relationships as well, which should be fun. Very much look forward to seeing that. Um, there's uh, one uh, last question here uh, from uh, Netza uh, saying, um, how does your work have any um, impact on our current understanding of high status princely burials like Sutton Hill and Prittlewell? Yeah, I mean, we haven't sampled them because they haven't got bodies and that's really a problem. <laughs> There's no no human remains from either yeah. uh, Sutton or Prittlewell. If they were, I'd have been knocking on the door of the, <laughs> the storeroom. Um, I mean, you know, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, so Sutton Who uh, is supposed to be uh, from the Woofings with a Swedish connection. I mean, and really, you know, we are seeing so significant continental connections. I, I think... What, what I quite like is that um, we've got the Dover, the Dover girl what, um, in, is it 250? I can't remember about this line, um, where you know, we can very clearly see that she has come from Scandinavia and that that is coming you know, to extend trade and political connections. And that is the significant component of um, trade exchange, identity and family histories that's taking place in this period of the early Middle Ages. So it wouldn't be unremarkable to see that in, in, in a site like Woof, in, with the Woofings of our like Sutton Who, I don't think, this sort of continuous and significant intermarriage and connectedness with, um, with the continent with, and with Scandinavia in particular. So I think it, it shows us that people don't sort of arrive and then they become insular very quickly. But actually, the reason they become important and wealthy is in part because of those um, exogamous marriage strategies and, and trade and exchange opportunities and political opportunities that arise as a, as a result of internationalisation. Uh, Duncan, that, that, that's all the questions. Can I, on the behalf of the society and I'm sure the, the audience, thank you. Uh, very much indeed a, a metaphorical uh, loud round of applause uh, to to mark that um, I uh, give notice that the uh, next meeting of the society will be on Thursday the 30th of March at 5 p.m um, when we will hear a paper British Travellers and the Discovery of the Alhambra uh, 1760 to 1830 by Rowie Sweet and Richard 